So now that we're starting to get into sequential logic circuits, you're going to start seeing uh, these circuits functions being represented by something like this. This is what's referred to as a timing diagram. And the reason why is because sequential logic, as the, the name would suggest, is logic that happens in a sequence. Sequence suggests time. And time is not something that we can represent in our truth tables that we've been using up until now. So we kind of have to switch our way of representing our circuits function uh, from truth tables to timing diagrams because it's the best way to represent how a circuit behaves over time or how a circuit behaves over a particular sequence. Um, but there's a couple things that you need to know about timing diagrams um, because this is showing the uh, behavior of a circuit, in this case, a single bit over time. Um, there are certain actions that that bit can perform that we actually have a name for. So obviously, when it is low over the course of a time, we, we call that just low or the, uh, the low state. Um, likewise, when it's high, we already have a name for that. That's just the high state. And of course, in truth tables, we would represent with, with a, a zero and a one. Um, but then there's these two other transitions that can happen. And that is the transition from high to low and the transition from low to high. Um, these have special names. Uh, we call this one right here the falling edge because it is the edge that is falling down from high to low. And likewise, this one is the rising edge. Uh, we call that that because it's rising from low to high. This one's also referred to as the negative edge and this one as the positive edge. And so you might think something like that doesn't sound very useful, the, you know, calling something like this a rising edge and something like this a falling edge, you wouldn't think that that have, would have too many particular uses. And if you were just looking at it from the perspective of combination logic, which is what we've been going over so far, you'd be correct. There's no point in distinguishing rising and falling edges. A state is a state, and that's all that really matters. Uh, but in sequential logic, that can actually uh, matter tremendously. There are certain circuits that operate on state, uh, or the states of a wire, and there are some circuits that operate on the transitions of a wire or the edges of a wire. Um, and so here we actually have the timing diagram for what we're later going to uh, cover as a D flip-flop or a data flip-flop. And you can actually see that, um, well, Q uh, seems to go high only if D is on and the clock is at the rising edge or C input here is on the rising edge. Um, this particular circuit only concerns the D input when C is on a rising edge. In all other instances, it doesn't care what the what the D input is. Um, Q doesn't change. So that is one circuit that is uh, dependent on a rising edge. You'll also find circuits as we move on into more advanced sequential circuits that rely on falling edges. Sometimes they actually rely on, on both. So going forward, we're going to be covering some more advanced sequential circuits. Um, and anytime you hear somebody refer to something being edge sensitive, that usually just means that it's looking for one of these edges. If it's positive edge or rising edge sensitive, it's looking for a rising edge, falling edge, or negative edge sensitive, it's looking for the falling edge. Representing an input that's uh, edge sensitive on a circuit isn't very difficult, actually. We just simply draw a triangle around the input. So uh, if a normal input were to just look like this, we'll just call it I2, um, then a rising edge sensitive input would look like this, just a little triangle uh, drawn around the, the input here. And then for a falling edge, it's actually um, just as simple. You basically just draw a triangle like this and put a little uh, bubble in there, uh, just a little inversion bubble. And the reason why is because if you look at a wave over time, let me just draw one here real quick. Uh, let's get a different color. So here's my wave over time. Um, we can see here that um, as time progresses, the signal's off, then it transitions to on, then off again. We have a rising edge here and a falling edge here. Let me grab a different color for this. If we invert this, anytime it's on, um, or anytime it's off, it's on, and then anytime it is on, it's off, um, you'll notice that the edges get inverted too. So here we have the signal going from off to on with a transition, a high, um, a high edge or a rising edge from low to high. And when we invert it, it becomes a high signal that transitions to a low signal with a falling edge. 
Um, so if we have an input, we'll just draw that again, that is rising edge sensitive, um, and we want to make it a falling edge sensitive, what we can do is we can invert it. And so anytime this signal coming in transitions from high to low, that inverter is going to change it from low to high, and that's going to trigger that uh, edge detection circuit. Okay, so now we know exactly what a, an edge is, what a rising edge and what a falling edge is, and we know how it's represented as schematic. Um, we just draw the rising edge circuit, and if we want to represent it as a falling edge, uh, we just invert it. So how exactly does one build a rising edge detection circuit? Well, there's a lot of different ways to do it, and depending on the medium, uh, that you know, technique is going to change, but the principle typically remains the same. What you usually have is you usually have an input, and that input is fed down two paths. The first path goes directly into one input of an AND gate, and the other uh, goes through some kind of a delay circuit, and then through an inverted input of the same AND gate. And uh, what that does, and we'll actually show you on a timing diagram here, look, we're already using timing diagrams, um, what that does is it basically looks for the instant, the only instant in time where i is a 1 and the delayed input lowercase d is a 0. So if we actually look at this here, I've got i and lowercase d drawn out. Um, so if we look, we're basically looking for, since lowercase d is inverted, we're looking for when this is a low um, and this is a high. So if we draw this out here, we can see both are low, so that's going to be a 0. Um, and then in, in this instance, we have I transition from zero to one, so that counts as a high. Um, D hasn't quite gotten there yet. I know it's kind of overlapping, but just pretend it starts here. Um, so that is a one on I and a zero on D. That actually triggers our AND gate. That counts as an, as, uh, an on condition. So then we continue on, and then eventually D transitions from low to high. Well, that no longer trips our AND gate, so that turns off again. Oop. Let's make that a little bit straighter. And then as we progress on, because both inputs are one, the AND gate remains off. And then now we've gotten to the point where uh, I is now off. So because I is a zero and D is a one, which translates into a zero, that gate is now, or it's still off. Likewise, when D finally transitions from one to zero, remember that's zero to one, doesn't really matter because I is still a zero, so the gate remains off. And so this circuit right here uh, generates this wave, uh, or this uh, timing diagram here, which shows that Q is only ever going to turn on for the briefest moment as I is transitioning from zero to one, and only in that instance.